2,000 oxidative concentrators, 1,200 oxygen cylinders, and 150 ventilators. Uh, the role of the chamber. Uh, I remember Dr. Chandru late at night at about 10 o'clock called Johnson and I, and he mooted the idea that in this this scenario of pandemic, the second wave in India, how can Singapore help uh, our brothers and sisters in India? And then the whole community, there were many other associations who were thinking alike. Under the guidance of the Honorable High Commissioner, we all came together and a very concerted effort was done uh, with great support from Singapore government behind us. We started a virtual command center on 26th April started fundraising from public on 20th April with all permissions taken very quickly and that's where the support came from the Singapore government. Raised estimated 1 million for corporates and other members of public so corporates came in very quickly. Telegram channel and website updates, direct fund transfers, pay now, DPS links, all kinds of facilities were activated. The Chamber, Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce, role in the Joint Task Force, we started doing the coordination. We worked very closely with Red Cross. The Red Cross helped us with procurement team. It is worth mentioning that Tamasek also chipped in and gave us all their contacts and supplies, the supplier connections. The Pan IIM and Pan IIT alumni associations supported by McKinsey came in. Private individuals. Uh, even people from households, there's a very touching story of how a person, Dr. Chandru, donated a wheelchair. Uh, wheelchair bound people came forward, uh, corporate purchases, we must special mention to Adani, Mr. JJ Adani, Mr. JJ is here from the Adani group, thank you JJ. Uh, Tamasek came forward as I said, so many people volunteered and there was a complete momentum created in the last six weeks and you can see the results. Of course, we processed the donation certificates and delivery documents. Uh, we also uh, worked with the High Commissioner to uh, High Commission to find out warehousing space which was provided by corporates. So all this happened very quickly. I'm going to skip this chart. Uh, we also started providing sourcing points. So, for example, a quick uh, dashboard which was uh, created data from Swast app, uh, MyGov. So people found when uh, there were three levels of cooperation happening, the G2, government to government, business to business, and people to people. So many people wanted to buy quickly things and send to their villages, the hometowns, their states. So we provided them the dashboard and the connections. So individuals, as Indian government started opening up imports, individuals also started sending various aids, one-to-one to, one to their families. Next. I'm going to skip this, you all know the data. Uh, there was an India COVID-19 WhatsApp chat box, which was available. So we provided the information to various people, various families, organizations, so they could use this. Next. The steps taken to combat in summary, oxygen supply. India started accepting oxygen from 40 countries, including Singapore. Uh, during the second COVID-19 wave, countries have sent close to 550 oxy oxygen generating plants, 4,000 oxygen concentrators and 10,000 oxygen cylinders. Alternative vaccination sources have been uh, sourced and provided. Uh, increasing of age of vaccination. So, so many actions have been taken at the India side, but we would learn more from the Honorable Minister and other panelists. Uh, so this was a quick update. I think this is the last chapter. So this is a five-minute update. Uh, uh, Honorable Minister, we thought we should give you a background so you get to know what the task force is doing. And with that, uh, I would now hand over the proceeding to our Honorable Chairman of Sikhi, Dr. Chandru. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, indeed, you have relieved me of my duty to introduce the panel members here. But nevertheless, uh, I must say that uh, I'm honored and happy, privileged to be in the midst of, on my right hand side, the High Commissioner, Mr. Kumaran, and also, of course, we have the Tamil Nadu Finance and Human Resource Minister, Dr. Baldwin. Baldwin, sir. 
Uh, just just a few words, you know, on, on, on the latest updates. But before that, just just to give a positive comment, I must say that the Tamil Nadu government, indeed, you know, must comment on a commendable effort to contain the COVID nineteen surge. Chennai, in particular, which reported about seven thousand COVID nineteen positive cases per day earlier was only reporting about 2,000 cases over the past few days. Now, during the past three weeks, with the new DFK government, the state has been focusing on improving the medical infrastructure. And I must say, you are doing a wonderful job. Over 300,000 people... Sorry, sorry. Okay. No, no, sorry. My problem. Sorry. The, the, over 300,000 people were being vaccinated a day. RT-PCR tests were being undertaken on over 170,000 people a day across Tamil Nadu. Now, this is a fabulous thing. A mammoth task, I can say. Now, we're very, very happy to note that Tamil Nadu is the only state in India to stick to the 100% RT-PCR and the gold standard for COVID-19 testing, which means that they are ensuring both quantitative as well as qualitative testing. I think that's so very important. Now, of course, it that leaves me with great pleasure to invite His Excellency Mr. B. Kumar to say a few words. Mr. Kumar. Honorable Minister of Finance and Insha, Dr. Prityagarajan, Dr. Tamil Nadu, Dr. P. Chandru, Chairman Sikhi, Mr. Manish Tripathi, Vice Chairman Sikhi, Dr. Joshua Kumar, Mr. Benjamin from Singapore Red Cross, Mr. Jay Kumar, Mr. Sankar Nagan, and Mr. Rajkumar of Isha, and Mr. Manish Gupta. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to. Uh, get any chance to come to Sikhi, meet friends and colleagues, uh, to try and work together on various initiatives that help to advance the cause of India-Singapore relations. Uh, today, of course, uh, we are all gathered here to uh, thank Sikhi for all the efforts put in over the last uh, uh, six, seven weeks uh, to try and mobilize assistance for COVID relief, COVID mitigation efforts in India. Uh, I, along with all the bad news that we've been bombarded with over the last few weeks. Uh, in, in recent days, we also have uh, some good news in terms of improvements uh, in the uh, COVID situation in India. Uh, as you are aware uh, from various uh, news reports uh, coming in from India, uh, the numbers in India are now receding. After reaching nearly 450,000 uh, new infections per day and about 4,200 deaths per day, uh, uh, the number of infections per million persons reached uh, a high of 283 uh, at the peak of the uh, infection levels in India. Uh, but based on current trends, it now appears that we may have peaked uh, in the second wave around the middle of May. Uh, the B1617 uh, strain, which is much more infectious, clearly caused a huge havoc to our healthcare system. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, we had 134,000 new cases and about 2,887 deaths. Uh, these are, uh, in terms of absolute numbers, extremely uh, large. Uh, but compared to the peak that we saw a few weeks earlier, uh, these are still uh, encouraging. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, looks like the direction in which uh, we are moving uh, is, is broadly uh, the correct one. The infections per million have also dropped to about 97 now, uh, compared to 283 at the peak of the second wave. Uh, if you look at the number of COVID deaths per million persons, that is also very instructive. At the peak of the first wave, when we had about 97,000 uh, new infections per day, uh, the uh, COVID deaths per million were about 0 0.84. 
At the peak of the second wave, this reached about 3.04, which is about more than uh, close to about four times higher than the uh, peak reached in the first wave. The current level is uh, slightly lower at 2.06. Still, a lot of work to do. Uh, but uh, death numbers are a lagging indicator compared to the infection numbers. And therefore, uh, in a week or two, we'll probably see these uh, death numbers also dropping. Uh, overall, the, uh, the encouraging news is also that India has administered about 213 million vaccine doses uh, since the start of the vaccination program, covering nearly 12% of the population. Uh, still nowhere near uh, any, any level that can give us uh, comfort close to herd immunity. Uh, there's still much more work to do. The government has taken uh, a large number of initiatives to try and improve vaccine availability. I'll just come to it in a minute. Uh, but over the last year, year and a half, our economy has taken a massive hit. In fact, uh, for financial year 2021, the growth rate was a negative 7.2%. Uh, it, it shows uh, how deep the uh, economic hit has been. Uh, there is uh, a, a substantial loss of jobs. And all that has to be recovered with uh, growth rates improving in the next year or two years uh, so that uh, the damaging effects of the uh, COVID pandemic can be reversed uh, in the coming years. Uh, there has also been a substantial uh, improvement in medical oxygen availability. Uh, the Prime Minister had noted in his address uh, a couple of days ago that uh, the uh, increase in medical oxygen production has been nine times what it was before the second wave started. Uh, a large number of ISO kinds, oxygen cylinders, and concentrators have been procured from all over the world, including from Singapore. Uh, as I was mentioning, vaccine availability has been ramped up in a big way, with several new production facilities being set up and arrangements underway to procure vaccines from abroad. Uh, in about four to six weeks, the government of India uh, targets availability to reach about 10 million doses per day uh, so that the vaccination program can proceed ahead at full speed. Uh, we are thankful to the Indian community and to Sikki uh, for the support for COVID mitigation efforts in India, both in terms of essential equipment such as oxygen cylinders and concentrators, uh, and also for pulling together contributions from their members and other corporate donors, uh, such as Lisha, Adani, Mary Duty, and a number of others. Uh, many Indian diaspora organizations have also chipped in with uh, appreciable efforts, uh, tied uh, the Indus entrepreneurs, IIT Alumni Association, and IIM Alumni Association. Uh, there was also an initiative called SUMO uh, by Indian alumni of prominent Singaporean universities such as NUS, NTU, SMU, etc. Uh, they raised about $200,000 for procuring uh, oxygen cylinders and concentrators. The Global Indian International School, uh, they chipped in uh, with uh, uh, equipment required to produce oxygen. The Art of Living Foundation and a number of uh, regional and state level Indian associations uh, from Singapore also uh, contributed whatever they could uh, to assist in India. All of this is extremely valuable and we are thankful to all these organizations uh, for the help rendered at a time when India was going through an extreme difficulty uh, in terms of managing uh, COVID. Singapore has been very valuable to us at this difficult time in view of its position as a vital trade and logistics hub. Uh, we have been able to mop up supplies of uh, Oxygen tanks, cylinders, concentration, concentrators, and bypass machines and ventilators. We are thankful to the government of Singapore and its various departments, particularly MTI, Ministry of Trade and Industry, the Defense Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Health, and Enterprise Singapore for their support in these challenging times. Uh, we are also grateful for the assistance channeled to India through uh, Temasek Foundation and Singapore Red Cross. Uh, before I conclude, I'm also very happy that uh, Dr. P. Kangrathan, Honorable Minister for Finance and Human Resources, Governor Tamil Nadu, has been able to join us today for this event. His presence is certainly an acknowledgement of the fact that a large share of the Indian diaspora in Singapore, particularly of earlier vintage, 
traces its origins to Tamil Nadu and continues to have family connections there. It is also an indication of the fact that Singapore continues to hold a special place in the minister's heart since he worked here from 2010 to 16 as MD with Standard Chartered Bank. The second wave took all of us by surprise in India. The center and many state governments are now preparing much more carefully for a potential third wave, uh, which we hope uh, never comes about, uh, but it is good to be prepared uh, in, in all possible ways. These are clearly difficult times as the virus continues to mutate and find ways around our defensive strategies. Unlike us human beings, the virus has one job to survive. It will do everything it can to survive and prosper for as long as it can. Our countries need to cooperate and help each other minimize the damage caused by COVID-19. It is clear by now that no one is safe until everyone is safe and the virus is eradicated from all regions. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe now request Honorable Minister for Finance and Human Resources Dr. Thangarajan, Government of Tamil Nadu, to please address us, say a few words, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you um, for this chance to express my gratitude. Firstly, uh, to our High Commissioner, uh, Mr. Kumaran, also to my own friend, Dr. Chandru, uh, Mr. Manish Tripathi, who uh, welcomed all of us, and Mr. Manish Gupta, who is due to speak, and for everybody who put this event together, first, uh, my, my thanks and my gratitude. As our High Commissioner mentioned, uh, I have multiple reasons to feel very strongly connected to Singapore. Uh, as a young boy, I think the first time I left India back in 1977 was to visit some family friends and attend some religious ceremonies in Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, over the course of a career that spanned consulting and banking and trading, I had many reasons or many occasions to travel to Singapore. I lived there for a while, uh, as, as the Honorable High Commissioner mentioned. Uh, I had many strong friendships. My children have very fond memories. Uh, I, I see Singapore as a model state, one where the application of planning, uh, science, technology, and the, the perpetual drive to, uh, to improve. I once recall, uh, I recall a um, standard chartered event where Honorable Minister, now Senior Minister Tanmun Shanmur Ratnam was our chief guest at the standard chartered event with our CEO. And uh, he made a very telling comment. Uh, when asked what drives him to keep going or what uh, to keep uh, so uh, vested and so focused and so driven, uh, he made the comment to Mr. Sands, our then CEO, he said, well, Peter, like you, there's no natural reason we should exist. We don't take it for granted that this small island in the Indian Ocean has a, a natural reason to exist. And so we're always trying to see how we be more relevant, we'd be better state for our citizens and so forth. And I, that has stayed with me for, uh, for the years since. Of course, as a Tamil, uh, I have another uh, great reason for affection. Uh, in our culture, and if you'll, if you'll permit me, I'll just lapse uh, for a few minutes into Tamil for my uh, fellow Tamilians. Yadum ure yavarum kelir enre adipadai kalacharatil tattuvatil varra nam inatikku varlaatrileye Java, Keda, Sumatra, Alavil, Cholar Galatil, and the Irikra Uravum, and Vietnam, Laos, Arambiche, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, Kalam, Irikra, Pala Nutran, the Uravin, Adipadayum, Ilangai, Tamil Argil, and the Naraya Kuriakum or Karnat Nalum, Enrikime, Tamil Natukum, Singapore Natukum. Or Yinaikum, or Patrum, Pasamum, Irkum, and Rade, Irundade, Irkum, Nidicum, and Rade, Yarum, Kelvipuria, Yaradamum. And the Aripadailum, Matatra Mile Chair again, Matatra Mile Chair again, Indreki, Kalandu Rayad of the Lum, 
நீங்கள் எல்லாம் நாட்டுக்கும் எங்களுக்கும் செய்த உதவிக்கு நன்றி கூறுகிறது one of the things that our government did upon taking office less than a month ago was uh, to follow our leaders instruction that transparency accountability and an open engagement with the people was of the utmost importance as you know uh, uh, we have no experience as a country as a state in fact as a world not since the 1918 to 21 22 uh, spanish flu have we had this kind of a global pandemic and so we're all to be honest a bit struggling in the dark of course the light increases every day but the complexity of it is something we have never seen before and our basic philosophy is that uh, an integrated approach with the people rather than trying to keep data suppressed and so forth would be a much better uh, likelihood of getting rapid results and on that uh, perspective both in terms of the medical data the, the actual uh, cases the testing the, the fatalities the severity the science behind it is this a new strain is it not what are the implications of that as also how the government was working to contain it on all of these things we took a much more open transparent and i dare say uh, inclusive approach where we brought in so many specialists for example in madurai district we've been able to bring Uh, the peak of the curve down within two weeks because we took such a distributed approach. We brought in so many specialists, set up a task force. We extended our infrastructure into the villages to prevent spread into the villages, to prevent the village uh, rural population coming into the city because of uh, you know improved infrastructure in the city like the government hospital. And I am very happy to say, for example, we brought the numbers down to one third the peak in less than twelve days. so science works a rational approach works uh, keeping the people engaged works uh, and distributing the decision making the infrastructure the uh, the support services and uh, the testing facilities works coming to uh, a specific aspect of this we wanted to have much greater transparency in how donations were handled how they were accounted for Uh, the leaving of an audit trail uh, you know the the building of credibility that increases donors likelihood and comfort of uh, of uh, helping us and so as somebody who has through the course of my career been uh, under you know constant supervision in the financial services industry of the sec and fendra and so forth in the us of the uk fsa of the european regulators of mas of hkma of japan fsa since i ran global businesses i was simultaneously under the scrutiny of so many regulators and had so many compliance obligations and in fact was the one who championed the new mas uh, exam certification process within standard chartered bank and insisted that starting with me down the senior most managing director in my uh, division that everybody who faced a client or who potentially oversaw somebody who faced a client ought to be certified and ought to be registered so from that perspective you know we bring that kind of intensity and and uh, track record to our transparency reporting auditability and you know in a time of crisis if you don't pay attention to these things uh, it, it, without even malintent things break down you know we are we, are, we have uh, many ways that things can break down so i think we have reached a point where we have uh, high credibility based on our uh, actions we publish every day the funds received into the chief minister's disaster relief fund we publish every few days what they have been allocated for every single bill for purchase of items from that disaster relief fund goes through my department my desk and i personally sign those bills so i can account for every rupee uh, and every dollar that is in you know in that uh, in that fund as for the uh, covid situation today it's no uh, you know kind of uh, secret that we have new variant at least and potentially more uh, of course the human costs are, are tragic uh, we see so many cases of families ripped apart of, of orphans left behind after both parents have passed uh, every single death is a, is a kind of body blow to us and those of us in administration take these costs very seriously Uh, we try our best to be logical in allocating very scarce resources 
uh, starting with doctors and, and frontline medical workers and policemen in, in terms of vaccinations and, and the equipment. Um, you know, now my chief minister has expanded that to journalists and other people who are crucial for the functioning of a democracy. Uh, and today, for example, uh, we expanded the, um, the priority given to industrial workers who have to congregate to keep our production going and our economy up to the priests in temples. So I've just come back from the Mother Minakshi Temple, which is in my constituency and I'm the MLA for, where we have started a prioritized vaccination drive for temple priests and administration. Because once the lockdown ends in a few days, we expect that people will start congregating at temples. So, you know, the situation is a lot better than it used to be. It is still quite dire and we still need a lot of help. Of course, at a time like this, you know, there's some kind of attempts to create some mischief from a political perspective. Let me assure you that there is no politics involved in any of these activities. It doesn't matter which government is in power. Tamil Nadu has prided itself that for the last 50, 60 years, irrespective of regime change, there has been continuity of policy. Uh, of course, there are some questions about what is the role of the federal or union government compared to what is the role of the state government. These were already uh, in some question before the crisis. And obviously a crisis like this highlights, uh, you know, where the gaps lie or where the, the differences in opinion lie. And therefore there are some discussions about that, but that's healthy in a democracy and they need resolving at some point. Other than that, I can assure you that there is no kind of uh, politics at all involved in any of this. But since I'm speaking now to uh, uh, Siki, which is industrialists, entrepreneurs, businessmen, I want to shift the focus a little bit and say, as grateful as we are for your aid and as, uh, you know, as focused as we are today on uh, getting past this crisis, uh, which, as I say, we see light at the end of the tunnel, at least of the second wave. We are also thinking of the future. And since this is my first chance to address this uh, August group, as the finance minister of Tamil Nadu, I want to talk about, you know, in addition to the, the strong ties we have by family, by language, by culture, by history, uh, we also want to have very strong commercial and economic ties uh, with uh, Singapore. Uh, by coincidence, my personal friend, Dilan Pillai, has now taken over the CEO of Tamasek. I noticed gladly, uh, you know, there are many people, my, my good friend, Gautam Banerjee, uh, at the uh, um, Blackstone Asia, Ch Asia Pacific Chairman. So I, I, I recall fondly the many friends uh, from my Singapore days, and I look forward to working closely with them and others and uh, bearings and all of the investors to uh, see how we can do mutually uh, kind of beneficial um, investments, projects, and growth oriented schemes. And in particular, I was just jotting down a few things where I think there's a natural synergy. Uh, of course, the call centers, but also IT uh, enabled enhanced call centers and digitalization, starting with our own government processes to overall kind of uh, uh, e-governance to things like that. We have a lot of improvements to make. In terms of investments, uh, the crisis has taught us that we need to get much more self-reliant in medical technology, in pharmaceuticals, uh, in kind of resilience uh, related to oxygen production, things like that. But also uh, we think that the, the, the kind of uh, synergy of a place like Tamil Nadu, which is a large state, population of 80 million people, large land banks, and a place like Singapore that can be a, in a thought leader, innovative, high-tech, scientific, partner with uh, a relatively high amounts of capital and a global uh, capacity to attract global capital, you know, things like educational technology, uh, food technology, improvement of the agricultural uh, chain and, and the processes, uh, green initiatives, sustainable development. For example, we think the future of electricity generation is much more in microgrids and uh, sustainable kind of green energy grids. And as you know, we are the number one state in Tamil Nadu for renewable energy already, uh, largely wind and solar. And uh, uh, the Adani Group is, is a big investor in that in Tamil Nadu. So we think there are so many initiatives on which we can work together. And I hope that uh, you know uh, this is just the beginning of that. 
Of course, we never forget our friends, as uh, as the Quran has it. Uh, there is hope for he who has lost every other virtue. There is no hope for whom has lost gratitude. So you know, we we will never forget the help of our friends in times of distress. Uh, but we have ties that go beyond one crisis, and we hope to further those ties as time goes on. Uh, I don't want to take too much more time. I just want to thank everybody involved, particularly Siki for being kind of the noble agency of bringing it all together, the Singapore Red Cross for facilitating the transfers and uh, the paperwork and logistics, the many contributors on, from the private and individuals, and uh, you know also, if I may say so, the, the benevolent hand of uh, of uh, Senior Minister uh, Tanman as well as Minister Vivian and people of uh, Tamil um, uh, and, and generally Indian, uh, both background and disposition. And so I'm grateful to all of you. And on behalf of the people of Tamil Nadu, we appreciate it very much. And we look forward to uh, working closely with you once we are past this crisis, which we hope will be in the not too distant future. Thank you again for inviting me and for the opportunity. All right. Thank you, Honorable Minister. It was such a powerful message. Honorable Minister uh, talked about the COVID mitigation, but sir, you also instilled hope. You talked about the future and the business. So thank you for doing that. There is hope also. So now may I request Mr. Manish Gupta, managing editor of managing editor of PIM TV, to say a few words. Manish. So thank you. First of all, uh, greetings to the Honorable Minister and, uh, and the High Commissioner and uh, all my friends from Siki and others who have joined here today. Uh, I think uh, we have definitely got a good handle on the situation of what's happening on COVID in India and the state's effort, particularly Tamil Nadu's efforts from both the Minister, High Commissioner and others. I did have a presentation that I created and I passed it on. Uh, I can pull it up just and, and go through it very, very quickly because I don't want to take people through a lot of statistics. But um, uh, let me start by saying that I am a part of the diaspora myself. I migrated to the US in 1987. I have uh, some close friends, Minister, you might know V. Shankar from the Standard Chartered a long time back, going back to Citibank and Bank of America days. And, uh, and of course, very close relationship with Singapore and, and now with Siki, uh, Paul Johnson and others. Uh, we, know that, we know that India, despite the challenges, as Minister rightly pointed out, that we were sort of caught unawares, but we have no independent uh, country history of dealing with pandemics like this. So we've, I've, I've watched the world, I've seen pandemics, I've seen crises, I've seen wars around the world. But I think India has risen to the occasion, and I try to tell this to my... Uh, foreign correspondent friends who share the foreign correspondence club with me in South Asia, of South Asia in, in New Delhi, that this is a, is, a, is a nightmare of a challenge for a country like India, where we have federal democracy, where we have very powerful states, where we are still ironing out how to work between the federal government and the state government on a lot of things. And where healthcare infrastructure still needs a lot of work. So I will move forward with my presentation very quickly, if I could just ask somebody who's helping me there. To, to just keep, uh, these are just numbers which uh, I have collected, interestingly enough, uh, when Johnson told me about this, I work very closely with the MEA, the Ministry of Health and, Fund and Family Welfare, UNICEF, uh, Indian Red Cross, and Invest India. So I put together a lot of numbers, but I can leave them here. India has done incredibly well, even in the second wave, to have turned around from a situation where the world and some commentators had said, we'll have a millions of dead people and in millions they said tens of millions not just a few million so i don't want to get into that dispute but we have turned around and uh, there's been a 50 percent decline and the states and the and the center are working very close together we could keep moving um, the next slide the recoveries and testing are on on the upswing again very big i mean recoveries of 92 percent for a country like india despite the second wave testing going up to millions, two million on an average daily are, are stupendous numbers for us to achieve. And I think RT-PCR is the way to go and new tests will be coming with a new variants. We just have to keep up with technology. Uh, next slide, please. 
this is what india has done i mean with the uh, 218 million uh, both doses given so far but i think the astounding numbers which i keep hearing every day as a media person from the government of india and others keep uh, let's go to the next slide please uh, are that expected vac uh, vaccine production and capacity increase in india is going to go very high uh, serum institute is estimated to do 90 to 100 million in june and uh, the current capacity has been 65 million bharat biotech is aiming at 100 to 120 million by july and early august and russia is expected to also start production in india 3 million doses are here uh, so india seems to be gearing up for vaccination which is the only way right now to fight this other than you know giving be giving people respite from the disease when they capture it uh, next slide please so we feel, I mean, this is something that the minister announced yesterday, and I hope India achieves it, that by December 2021, if plans go right, if what ICMR, Biotech, SAI, and, and Ready Lab go in with the production of vaccine, then we should have enough vaccine that we should have vaccinated a billion people. And that's when we would be in a comfortable position. Uh, second wave, third wave, we can't predict what will happen. Next slide, please. See, let's let's go to the foreign support. And I want to make a, a special mention here that during the first wave, when India reached out to the world, whether it was, it was with paracetamol or hydroxychloroquine or with vaccines, when it got when it got vaccines going in India, was a great gesture. And today, those countries can return that gesture by saying India helped us. We are India, we are helping India back, and that is very important. India has given up its policy change of 16 years ago to not accept aid. And now it's going out to the governments and saying, yes, we must uh, enhance and increase cooperation and collaboration. To that effect, as a newsman, again, I must point out uh, the other day I heard the world, uh, uh, this WHO uh, Director General talk on Africa Day. And he said that countries have to give up what is vaccine uh, nationalism and vaccine apartheid. We must cooperate and collaborate and competition and confrontation has to be given up. So I think what this epidemic or pandemic has teacher, ta taught us in the whole world, and I think India took the lead in it, is that cooperation and collaboration, whether it's internal or external, is the way to go. Science and technology is the focus, research and development, which we have seen that unless we had that and we had vaccine producing uh, laboratories uh, and manufacturing units, we would be in a very, very bad situation now. In terms of foreign aid, uh, India gave vaccines to 95 countries, and that's that's that speaks a lot. India has also repatriated 9 million people, at least, that the count that I get officially, both of Indians coming from outside India back to the country, Indians who had to leave and go back to their country, wherever they live, and also foreigners living in India. And this next slide, please, is the reason why the world is now coming back with an overwhelming outpouring support to India. I would say at least 40 countries and the number of countries and the aid is increasing every day. But at least 40 countries have given, and these are numbers in front of you, some nearly 20,000 concentrators, 20,000 cylinders, you know, hundreds of oxygen generation plant, 20,000 ventilators, BiPAPs. I know personally of at least 10,000 more BiPAP, CPAP machines which are on uh, on the way to India, lakhs of doses of whether it was remdesivir when it was needed or flavipavir. But, you know, all of this spells out what's happening in India and, and, and some of the countries. Next slide, please. I think uh, we have to also understand that wherever Indian diaspora and the minister traversed his story of a uh, very interesting story, I have mine and I'm sure all of you do yours. But wherever the Indian diaspora has, has migrated to and become assimilated and participated in the country's growth and development and maturity, uh, over 200 plus years that we know of, those countries have been actually influenced by the diaspora and India's outreach to those countries to start supporting India. Whether it's been through cash or supplies, medical equipment, even medical doctors providing advice. And I think leading among these countries are USA, UK, Singapore, Canada, Middle East countries, Australia, New Zealand, many European countries, and even African countries, particularly like South Africa. Next slide, please. Among the notable diaspora and diaspora-related organizations that have, meant, that have done a lot for India, and there are many, many organizations, very difficult to take names of all, 
but I have seen personally and observed the work of SEBA International, India's Fora from United States, US IBC, SIKI, through its multifarious approach and, and, and of course the, the mission. The missions of the government of India worldwide have, have gone to work like never before in, in, in not only earlier phase one of uh, extending India's hand uh, of whatever we could to help, but also now in cooperating and collaborating and accumulating all the diaspora and internationally. Gopio International is one organization, and then there are those doctor organizations in, in America and, and UK and others. Um, I know that time is running out, so I would just say that there is, uh, there is one example I would like to give. Last, next slide, please. You know, Seba International has been an organization that has created chapters in 25 countries, and look at what they've done. I mean, Thousands of ration kits given out, medicine kits, concentrators, ventilators, oximeters, $22 million in US, uh, I mean, of US, uh, US dollars created uh, of, in aid worldwide. I think total, there's a hundred million dollars, at least that I can count, of aid in diaspora contributions from around the world. There are organizations that I haven't named called Gift of the Givers from South Africa, which is world known in disaster relief. And particularly, Minister, they have offered, I think, 2,500 CPAP machines to Tamil Nadu. And you know that South Africa, like other countries, has a lot of Tamil diaspora. So these are countries that have uh, come forward. And, uh, and, and going, I think, going forward, we need to understand that diaspora and the countries that, are, that can collaborate with India in science, technology, and innovation would be great partners in, in, the, in the future. And I think we should continue to cooperate, collaborate. That's uh, sort of my presentation for now. Uh, we've run out of time, but thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and, and good to see all of you. Thank you, Manish, for the very nice presentation. So with that, uh, uh, with your permission, sir, and uh, Dr. Chandro, may we quickly move towards the question answers. And uh, I think there is, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, there are, uh, there's another room, there are some journalists. So we have questions uh, on, uh, have been asked uh, online. Okay, I'm going to read the question and then uh, we'll see. So the questions, uh, if uh, honorable minister, I've made it so it'll be easier. Uh, they, they are all in the panel. How is the safeguards and control measures implemented? And how salient is the process? Given the alarming number of deaths per day, is there a compensatory and concrete compassionate process in place? This is from Dr. Gideon Han. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I should not exceed my brief. So let me talk about what I do know, which is Tamil Nadu. Uh, I don't, all my, all my comments would be, uh, constrained only to Tamil Nadu because I don't know what happens outside Tamil Nadu. I, I haven't traveled and uh, reading secondhand news is not the basis for information. So within Tamil Nadu, I would say that uh, even while I was in opposition, I had filed a lawsuit with the High Court that the number of deaths were being uh, not reported properly because as a uh, legislator, I was tracking the deaths at the crematoriums and those numbers were higher than the, uh, the official statistics. Uh, the High Court took up my case, uh, other people, the press and so forth, we brought it up. But uh, I would say at the peak of the peak, we were seeing somewhere around two, two and a half percent as the kind of fatality rate. Now, of course, that is a huge number uh, in terms of um, the, uh, uh, you know, every loss is a big loss. But relative to global standards and relative to uh, the, the natural death rate, uh, what they call the total death rate uh, demographically in India, actually we have not had a really, really uh, kind of unbearable situation. It's tragic, every death is a, is a loss to somebody, to some family, to some son, you know, daughter, husband, wife, mother, father. But at a, at a macro level, um, you know, we, we, under normal circumstances, we should see about half a million deaths a year in Tamil Nadu. Uh, you break that down by month, day and all that, and we compare and see 
and uh, relative to the rest of the world, both the total death rate increase, explicable by COVID cases or not, was not that high. And the percentage of infected cases that uh, led, resulted in fatalities was not that high. It was not so in the first wave. It was not so in the second wave. And just to put that in context, the second wave was somewhere around three, four times the size of the first wave. So once our government came to power, and particularly in Madurai district, uh, which is about 3 million people, which I have been charged with overseeing, we started reporting the total uh, crematorium levels, uh, the processing levels, as a way of second checking ourselves. Uh, there's still a gap between what we can uh, count, but the gap has narrowed quite a lot. Uh, we got to the point of actually thinking about building additional crematoriums to make sure that people could pass with dignity. Um, but as it turned out, we never did exceed the capacity. We're still going to go ahead and build them anyway. You learn from crises and you develop infrastructure. But uh, we have now reached a point where, um, you know, just this morning, for example, before I came here, we had a, a, a bunch of sponsors come forward and we have said that anybody who passes from COVID, uh, the, the corporation of Madurai will pay the processing fees for the crematorium and we will not charge anybody a rupee at least to help be more compassionate, uh, you know, under the very trying circumstances. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that it's great. I'm not saying that it's, you know, uh, not, not tragic. I'm saying relative to what we feared and relative to what we have seen around the world, um, by God's grace, uh, we, we didn't hit that bottom. Thank you, sir. I think that really clearly answers the question. I I will go to the another question, sir. This is to you. It says, "Is uh, and it, it's a it's a large big. It's for government of India, sir. It says, is GOI pursuing the process of getting the approval of Bharat Biotech vaccine from WHO? So maybe uh, Honorable High Commissioner can take this." Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that because I, I don't know what efforts the government of India is taking. So, if you don't mind, uh, stick to what I know. Thank you, Srimiji. Uh, I understand that there are efforts being made to uh, apply for the future approval for uh, other point of action. I'm not aware of the exact uh, status of the application, but I can try and follow up on this by getting you further details. Thank you. Uh, I know, but before that, Gurdipji, you want to ask something? You are, you wanted to ask something? You raised your hand, so maybe I... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, my question, sir, is uh, the right question here. Initially. Nearly 100,000 labor shortage in Singapore, and most of it because of the Indians going back. Uh, is there any thinking or process whereby uh, something is being done to bring them back. I mean, projects have gone behind schedules and uh, uh, other businesses are reporting manpower shortage. So what process is being done? Is there something being done? Thank you. I apologize. I didn't quite hear that. Uh, can you just turn the volume up? Like I, I have my device on full volume. I'm I, I, will repeat the question, sir. I will repeat the question. Mr. Gurdjieff yeah. is asking, Close to 100,000 people have gone back and, and workers, mostly labor worker has gone back. And if there is a shortage, is there something being done to correct this scenario? Yeah. But I think Honorable High Commissioner said that this should be answered by the Singapore side or, or the Honorable uh, Minister. <laughs> it's not a Tamil Nadu thing. So maybe is uh, Dr. Chandru, you would... <laughs> Before that, I'm all the High Commissioner. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, it is clear that a large number of migrant workers uh, from India have gone back as a result of uh, the slowdown in the economy, uh, plus also the fact that uh, uh, you know, conditions in Singapore have, have required a reduction in the number of migrant workers. But uh, in recent months, the uh, return of some jobs clearly has uh, has created an opportunity for some of the workers to return. Uh, we understand that uh, many uh, contractors, construction companies, etc., and also 
companies who are in other sectors such as the red sector are talking to the government of Singapore and uh, urging them uh, to try and open up uh, entry of migrant workers to the extent required. Uh, from the part of the High Commission, we are in touch with the Ministry of Manpower uh, to try and facilitate anything that is required, but it is up to the uh, government of Singapore really to take this decision. And uh, we stand ready to collaborate and cooperate uh, uh, to the extent required. Uh, I think uh, we will wait and see how the situation develops. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a uh, policy in place uh, as far as Singapore government is concerned. And uh, we wait for the right time uh, uh, when this opportunity opens up. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, this question, Dr. Tundru, uh, maybe if you could take uh, Mr. Bala Subramaniam has asked, I understand that the first phase of the donation drive by Sikhi and Lisha is going on. How long do you think this will continue? Uh, the first phase started about three, four weeks ago. Yeah. I think we did extremely well. We, we put on you know, all banners and all requests. We went online and then we had a, in fact, we still have our bank accounts open. We are here today to present our track. When I say we, means uh, the Indian Chambers and our partner, Isha. We are here to present our track to the Singapore Red Cross today. Henceforth, henceforth, uh, it will, we are, we are hoping that, you know, there will be more donations that will come. But I would sincerely request that the future donations, rather than being channeled through the Singapore Indian Chamber, be directly given to the Red Cross because we still have, I believe the Red Cross still has until 30th of June. So our job is done in the sense that, you know, as a business chamber, we wanted to do something for the for, for our fellow Indians in India. And we have done our part, we'd like to do more. But we also have other tasks on hand. So we will be happy, uh, you know, in future donations. If it comes, we will still be channeling to the Red Cross, and that donation is still 30th of June. That's the point of the Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, from Nisha's side, I think uh, we are continuing with the donations. Okay, the first phase setting we have handed to uh, Singapore Red Cross. And the donation box is still there in, uh, back in Little India, uh, in front of the Little India Arcade. And uh, there are about uh, 25 of the donation uh, boxes in about 25 uh, of the business establishments. So as yes, uh, Singapore Red Cross is continuing to the 30th of June, I think uh, Nisha is also uh, will be doing uh, the donation drive. So whoever who wish to donate, it's still come to Little India and donate. And uh, if they are donating uh, uh, to a check, I uh, think they should write uh, the Singapore Red Cross Society. And uh, there are also uh, uh, donations collected by uh, digitally where there is a, a digital machine that they can come and just uh, get their uh, payway card uh, or credit card uh, to do their payments. Thank you. Last question. Honorable Minister, sir, last question. And this is, uh, it says, uh, I'm clubbing a few. How is the situation in rural India, sir? First, if we answer that, because it says, there is a digital divide between rural India and, and urban India. So how is the information flow and how the vaccine will be administrated in rural India? Yeah, I, I, I think we have a big, big issue here. So let me, you know, since I have this opportunity, let me try and shed some light in a broader context. Um, the gap between rural and urban India change is, is huge in many places, is less so in some places. Uh, it varies a lot state to state. And I'll just give you two examples. Um, 
I attended some seminars as an opposition legislator in uh, Delhi in the last five years. And my colleagues from Uttar Pradesh envisioned that the solution to lack of, let's say, underground drainage or, or pipe drinking water to a house was urbanization. That was their you know, uh, personal hope that increasing urbanization would reduce their problems. In Tamil Nadu, I said I'm a, a, a MLA from a 100% urban constituency and I have the reverse problem. We have such density of population and such aggregation happens so quickly that our infrastructure is unable to cope. And I wish that people would kind of be more evenly distributed. And that's because if you take a state like UP, uh, hardly 25% of the population, 20% lives in the cities or in the urban areas and 80% rural. A state like Tamil Nadu is almost 50-50. It's about 48, 52, something like that. Uh, slightly less urban than rural. So this is a very complex problem. It's, it starts with something as basic as access to infrastructure, access to education, access to medical facilities. In the case of a pandemic, there's kind of a tipping point. Once the infections go to rural areas, you are in much, much, much worse trouble than if you uh, contain them to the high density urban areas. Because A, it's a big populous country, so there's really no such thing as sparsely populated even in rural areas. And B, the, the medical infrastructure, the, the primary health centers, the availability of doctors, nurses, medicines, injections, all of it is substantially different. So for example, and I don't want to talk outside Tamil Nadu, it's not my ambit. So I'll just give you in Tamil Nadu, the biggest difference between Coimbatore district and Madurai district is that in Coimbatore district, the spread got outside the cities and uh, was prevalent in the rural areas. Now Coimbatore is one of the most advanced cities in, in Tamil Nadu, has some of the best hospitals, best infrastructure at some level, not in other ways. But Coimbatore district has struggled and struggled and struggled to keep, uh, you know, keep things under control and only now starting to see the turn after maybe four weeks. Uh, Madurai, on the other hand, we saw this problem coming. So even though I would say Tamil Nadu is probably the lowest urban rural divide of any state in India, even so we know the divide is big enough that it would be a serious problem for us. So we, uh, three weeks ago or two and a half weeks ago, took a decision that we will create 10 bed, five bed, uh, you know, uh, medical treatment facilities pre needing oxygen or ICU in every panchayat, in every union, uh, scale it up to a doctor and a nurse, uh, hired a lot of fourth year medical students and nursing students as temporary staff, distributed uh, from RT-PCR testing, which uh, as somebody pointed out, not only is Tamil Nadu the highest and only state that it only RT-PCR all, all, all crisis, but we do more in a day in RT-PCR than most states do, or all states do in RT-PCR plus rapid antigen. So uh, because we had that capacity, we sent the testing down to the villages, we sent the staff down to the villages, we engaged a lot of the women's self-help groups to do door-to-door -door surveys. What we thought would take us three weeks, they did it three days. They went and knocked on every door and found everybody who had symptoms, brought them to the local treatment center and tried to treat it. In our best indication is that there's a new variant. Really, as you, if you treat the early symptoms, the symptoms come early. And if you treat them early within the first two weeks with the kind of analgesics and the right drugs and bringing the, the, the severity down, down with proper nutrition and support, then they don't really lapse to the uh, stage of needing oxygen or, or uh, hospitalization. So we took a strategy that created tens of centers for testing, for vaccination, for beds, for doctors, for, in the uh, rural areas. And that has been our saving grace because it, it reduced both the, the, the severity, we got it early, we surveyed, we went proactively, found the people who had symptoms and brought them, isolated them. You know, not everybody has the luxury of isolating in a poor country where average house size may be 600 square feet or 700 square feet. So we created centers where they could come and be isolated. We always had them, but we had them in the cities for 2,000 beds, 1,000 beds, 800 beds. And that was not helpful. We needed 10 beds, 15 beds in every village. And so I think, you know, 
the urban rural divide is a reality at least in tamil nadu it is not so much a awareness and knowledge reality partly because of the history of our schemes partly because of you know penetration of television everywhere and the government wants to give away free tv to everybody uh, we have the least divide in internet access we are the the highest weighted average internet access state in tamil nadu and in india because we have like any other state we have 100% penetration in the cities but we have 60% plus penetration in the villages and uh, we are less rural than most of the states so you know we have been fortunate but we still admit that there is a big divide and we act to mitigate the consequences of that divide as locally and as distributively as possible that was a strategy we consciously took and uh, you know we've been fortunate that it worked out i'm not sure i i've already told you within tamil nadu not everybody took that strategy i don't know what that means outside tamil nadu i i don't want to talk about things i don't know thank you sir thank you sir i think the mic is Thank you, sir, for the very elaborate answer. It was very, very helpful. I think lots of insight was given to us. Thank you. With that, uh, with your permission, sir, we we'll come to the end of the Q and A session. And uh, apologies to so many other questions. Uh, they, you can write directly to the Sikhi website ID, and we we'll try and answer them. So we we'll come to the end of the first part. The second part, sir, is the chat presentation. where we have partner organizations like Lisha and Mr Rajkumar is here Shankar is here uh, we have Dr Joshua here from Bayrings uh, who have been the corporate donors Adani we already mentioned is here uh, of course uh, Mr Benjamin from his, uh, Red Cross is here so we'll hear from you so uh, honorable minister the next part is just a very quick uh, remarks and discussions and check presentations with the partner organizations and the corporate donors So uh, we will move to the next second part, sir. Uh, Johnson, I think I will request Dr. Chandru to yeah. once again set the stage for the second part, sir. Thank you, Manish. Uh, as chair, I owe my duty to update donors as well as the public uh, in terms of status of the public fundraising. Now, of course, it represents a significant phase uh, in terms of uh, you know, how we came about to help okay. save lives. Now, before I ask uh, my friends here, my partners, to say a few words, again, it's my duty to say a special thank you. Say a few words, which these people truly deserve. Now, in terms of donations. It came from three categories of donors: one, the public; that was the community organisation, and then the corporates. Donations were both in cash and time. Now, from the public, one group deserves a special mention. This group is naturalised Chinese Singaporean who raised funds from their friends in China. And supported this cause. I think that was very wonderful, you know, very very gracious, and that the very magnanimous of this group to 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 raise the sum. Now the donations, of course, uh, came you know ranging from three dollars to ten thousand dollars and more. And uh, one particular case that deserves a special mention. Is this lady, this lady who is in her late eighties, unwell, in a wheelchair, son not working, so us appealing for donations, immediately rang my CEO, who went to her house to collect a check, and she gave us from her savings seven thousand dollars. Plus a wheelchair. Now this is what happened. So we have cases like this where you know they 
took special interest, special liking, and, and Singaporeans in general, yeah, they're very big in the heart, and they're willing to give when there is a call. Now, in coming to community organizations, I must say that the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce, they were one of the first to go in and they believe 15,000 Singapore dollars. But it's a size of you know, to give to, you know, victims of COVID-19 in their children chamber. Now we also have the Wuhan Chan Monastery, who are among the first to donate to a space fund. We also have the Marwari Mandal Singapore, the Tamil Teachers Union, the Tamil Language Council Society, Gopio, the Hindu Sabai, and many, many Indian organizations who came forward. Now, under the corporate banner, we have hard network individuals who came forward, privately to donate. We had companies like Barrings Private Limited. It's a large private equity donator. Very sizable sum. We have Adani Global, very, very generous, gave us huge cash donations in addition to their medical equipment supplies. But, I mean, that's from Singapore, from other parts of the world, and I think within India itself, they will be very generous. So they deserve certainly a special mention. We also have a company called My Heart, Everest Link, and Amatsa Capital amongst those corporates who have given us huge sums of money. Now, certainly, uh, I would like to mention a few others, but uh, in the interest of time, I, I just want to say I owe a mountain of death to all these people. Now, I say this from the bottom of my heart because when this idea was mooted, my good friend Dr. Joshua rang me up and said, India is in dire need. Can the chamber do something? And I said to him readily, I said, yes, we are offer our help. It was just about a month. Now, it's amazing to see from the time we made the, the appeal to now to raise one million Singapore dollars in cash. That's a phenomenal thing. And I thank every donor who came forward to help. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, we would just go around the table uh, in no particular order, but maybe from that side, if uh, Mr. Rajkumar and Mr. Shankar, we could say a few words. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Then we can pass. I think we are happy to be part of it and thank Dr. Chandra. Who is this thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chandra, we will take this and we join hand and, and we had a donation box in Little India and almost we collected half of it. And even taxi drivers, yeah. am I might just speak. Yeah. Even taxi drivers and all uh, donated the object. So sometimes we were there watching. Um, Singaporeans, as Dr. Chandra said, they have a decent heart. They like to support regardless of other communities and all that. So even I saw some of them contributing by donating with five hundred dollars. So it's time to do a Lisa has uh, USD and contributed to previous together with for the Red Cross in Singapore, uh, Indian uh, tsunami and all that. 
uh, there was this very elderly lady. She made her way to Singapore Red Cross to donate. Along the way, she tripped and fell on a walking stick. She injured herself. Fortunately, my guys are familiar with the first aid, so they provided her with first aid and cleaned up. But she still insisted on staying back to donate before she made a way, got her grab and sent her home. So the response from the public has been tremendous from all sectors of the public and from all race and religion. Number two, the community organizations, as uh, Dr. Chandu pointed out, the private sector and the business sector, and faith based organizations. We have a lot of support from Buddhist organizations, uh, the Christian organizations, Catholics, and Muslim organizations. So we are very glad for the support. And of course, most of all, today I want to also recognize the support from Siki and Nisha. Uh, you have been tremendous partners over the many years, and we are thankful for the fact that we are, we are partnering you on this uh, uh, venture. I am glad to also report that uh, as of yesterday evening, we were close to reaching $6 million in our public appeal. And I'm sure today uh, we'll add to that further. Uh, so I want to be uh, thankful for that. I just want to make three points in this whole crisis. Number one, we had to overcome challenges that required speed, flexibility, and at the same time, we were very conscious that we needed to ensure reliability, transparency, and sound financial governance. And I think this is something that I want to assure our business that we will continue to do so, even if we are pressured to respond quickly. Number two is the partnership. And the partnership in this event has been tremendous. Government, both from Singapore side, as well as from the Indian side, uh, from the private sector, as well as from the non-governmental organization, like all of you, as well as the Indian Red Cross on the ground in, in, India, in India. The third point that I want to make is that this is a sustained response. Yes, we all want to do the immediate relief and we have been doing, and many organizations have been doing. Now we need to continue the support because the crisis is not over by a far long shot. But we are also looking at depending on the resources that we have, the next phase, which is to continue to support the communities that have been badly devastated uh, in terms of livelihood recovery. And my final point is that while we continue to keep our focus on India, we have also extended now our support to Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, countries in the region that are beginning to pick up sadly on the COVID-19 cases. So finally, on behalf of Singapore Red Cross, I want to thank all of you around the table in the Zoom uh, for this very sound and useful panel. Thank you. Honorable Finance Minister of Tamil Nadu, Dr. Pandir Rajan, friend of Singapore, we are happy to see you now. So it's a real privilege and pleasure to provide a small donation from Bali Private Equity Issue for this healthy cause. In fact, um, like uh, Siki Chandan mentioned, it was a great story about four year, weeks ago when I called him up and said there is a big issue going on in India. So he said, yes, I heard about that. What can we do? I said, can we join hand together and do some donation drawing? Immediately he said, yes, let us do that. And likewise, Leisha. Leisha being an organization in Little India, Shopkeepers Association, Siki being the organization with the Indian chamber, but they fully fledged, kind hearted, came forward to me and started this donation project. She was pretty appreciative. So, we just created an opportunity for Bali Private Equity to provide a donation. So, this is actually the second phase of the donation compared to the last year, where we have provided a small donation for Migrant Worker Center and 
also fellow Singaporeans. So it is a small way of offering a small portion of our gratitude to those who are affected in COVID. Since Manish Ji and uh, Mr. Singh are here and many other media people, uh, let me share with you three stories. The first story is related to a fellow Singaporean, elderly auntie of 82 years old. She walked over to the nation's booth, the beginning of this. So usually I just go over there and stand for a while with a couple of friends. In a way, I encourage the friends to put a donation. So this elderly auntie wearing the sorrow and the single shirt walk over there and just hold up the person who was standing there and say, this is a small donation. I want to give away. Make sure to send this money to India. I look at her, she got only $250 still. She wanted to put that $50 inside. So I should go, uh, we'll be happy to do what happens. And I can see in the hand, she received the money from some other agency as a financial assistance. Singapore financial assistance of $100. She has a heart to put $50 as a donation. She's not getting a million dollar payout like many of them in Singapore. That really just touches my heart. On the second part of it, so called the recipients, right? There are so many uh, theories and the questions about dissemination of medical equipment, etc. So, one of my fellow colleagues in, in India, he worked for an IT solutions company, was almost dying. So, he came back and did the photograph of oxygen concentrator sent from Singapore and sent to me. Thank you very much. We don't know who you are. This came from Singapore and there is a serial number because they wanted to monitor all the distribution from Singapore is going to which particular hospital and how they are it. So that second point touched my heart to say it's literally most of our assistance donation is going to the kind hearted of people. Then the third point I'd like to leave is in addition to what Manish has mentioned, the huge support is given by the Mass Foundation. Millions and millions of dollars worth of oxygen concentrators, cylinders, and medical equipment. That's the first batch went from Singapore, that is in the public domain. I was quite heartened to see a first batch of assistance to India is from Singapore. We, global Indian community, as one. And we are have been doing extremely very well together as a one community. That is an example, and that is a real message I managed to see during this crisis. Let us continue to do our part. And we do the best for the development of India's situation, and we will pray very hard for India to come out of the current crisis. I'm certainly confident many of the leaders, like Dr. Tiaga and many others, Taken the office, tirelessly working very hard, and we do our part. We are a small country from Singapore. With that, let me close my things. Be safe, continue to remain healthy, like what TMB mentioned, the three pointers we will follow, we will come up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Dr. Chandru. I, I don't have very much time uh, over what I said earlier in my remarks, uh, except to uh, note that although the drive to raise funds, supply equipment, etc., uh, to uh, help with COVID relief efforts in India has been driven by the Indian community, uh, other uh, ethnicities in Singapore have also been very generous in uh, contributing all kinds of assistance. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Chandu just mentioned that uh, the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce uh, contributed uh, $50,000 to the uh, uh, Siki uh, Isha Fund uh, for COVID assistance in India. I know for a fact that the SGX Singapore uh, Stock Exchange uh, contributed $100,000. Uh, 
uh, many well meaning individuals, high net worth individuals uh, contributed a number of corporate donors. Uh, overall, uh, you know, we were able to mobilize so much support from Singapore that it took the Indian Air Force 22 sorties uh, to uh, carry away uh, oxygen tanks from here. We made uh, three trips by Indian Navy ships. Uh, almost all of them were uh, fully loaded. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the list of items that went from Singapore uh, uh, is extremely impressive compared to a lot of other places from where we sourced material. Uh, we were able to source uh, 85 ISO tanks uh, from Singapore, and, and the number continues to add uh, even as we speak. Uh, given that uh, the IAS planes that come here usually are able to carry three to four tanks per plane, uh, you can imagine how valuable uh, uh, the availability of tanks has been. Uh, uh, Singapore's special position as a trade and logistics hub has helped us, uh, as uh, Mr. JJ noted. Uh, we are able to mop up availability of tanks from several other uh, locations in the region, uh, bring them to Singapore and then ship them to India. Uh, we have also uh, been fortunate in getting the uh, extreme support of Temasek Foundation, uh, uh, which supplied about 8,300 oxygen concentrators to India, uh, in addition to uh, 16,000 cylinders that we've been able to source from Singapore uh, over the last few weeks and about 2,000 Wi-Fi machines and ventilators. Uh, it's been very, very uh, impressive, uh, the kind of support we got from Indian business and diaspora organizations, uh, the Pan-IIT Alumni Association, the Pan-IIM Alumni Association, uh, Siki, uh, Isha, uh, the uh, Art of Living Foundation, uh, as I said, the uh, Alumni Association of Indian Origin Students uh, in prominent Singapore universities, uh, TIE, uh, Thai, and a number of other organizations. I am I, truly grateful for the kind of uh, groundswell of support that we've seen in Singapore. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we are, uh, you know, I will be uh, really short of words to thank all those who supported us through these difficult times. Thank you very much. So, may I also so with that, uh, Honorable Minister, sir, we have come to the to the end of the program. Uh, High Commissioner, sir, we will just take a photo. And before that, Dr. Chandru, I think the last part is the check check presentation. Right? Before before the vote for today. Uh, you, I think you should be in the center. You should be in the center. Camera, we are coming. Where is the camera? We are coming in the room. Okay, no, no, no. That's the camera. Okay. Uh, you hold the camera. Yeah. Are you sure this is the camera because you're seeing the back? Yeah. No, 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 no,
Let me just say, of course, uh, thank you again for everything, for the efforts, for the stories. It was so heartening to hear of the individuals, uh, for the funds, for the equipment, for all of the support. Uh, I'd be grateful if I could get copies of the, the presentations uh, because I can thank the, the right people. I apologize. I, uh, I didn't have the data ahead of time and uh, maybe I wasn't hearing well enough. So I would like to just uh, recognize everybody who contributed and, uh, and thank you again for having me. Thank you for the effort. We appreciate it. Uh, we know it's one key moment in a long-term relationship and we look forward to uh, a strengthened relationship coming out of these great initiatives at a difficult time for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. Those were, those were really nice, beautiful words. Let's, let's keep this warm relationship going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.